Um, this is breakout session three, where we'll be discussing the role of research in EMSC and explaining the Pediatric Emergency Care Applied Research Network, also known as PCARN, and the Data Coordinating Center. Our presenters will be Sally Jo Zuspan, who is the Director of the Business and Research Data Coordinating Center at the University of Utah's Department of Pediatrics. Sam Mahini, who is the Program Director at the Data Coordinating Center at the University of Utah. If you have any questions, um, just type them in the chat box and we'll try and get to them at the end, especially because we're a little short on time. Thanks. Well, welcome everybody and thank you for the introduction. So I know that we're a little short on time, so we're gonna zoom a little bit through this, zoom on Zoom. So if you can go to the next slide, that would be great. So there's a little animation here. I'll, I'll cue you when to click. Um, so I've been involved with PCARN for 18 years, and I'm glad to see that you all have attended this conference to see a little bit about uh, more about what we do. One of the most frequent questions that we get from the EMS community is what does PCARN do? And so we were asked to talk about what does PCARN and the Data Coordinating Center do? Um, people ask us, how can I use the research findings behind PCARN research? So you can go ahead and click. So the first thing we do in PCARN is really to ask those questions. We ask why, what can we do better? How do we give this treatment? When should we adapt our practices? So we ask the question, next click please. And the next thing we do is really we study. And so this is an example of the pediatric head CT rule that you may have seen before. We study the question and then next click. We then answer the question. So in a nutshell, if we have to only have one slide for the whole talk, this is it and this is what PCARN does. And we're gonna give you a little bit more information about how that happens throughout the rest of this talk. Next slide. So we're gonna talk about what the, how the DCC and PCARN fit into the EMSC program, describe some of the challenges that we encounter in trying to conduct high quality research in EMSC. And we're gonna describe what the DCC does and what the, our role is in assuring successful research. And we're going to share some research results with you and some planned studies that can help EMS providers. Next slide. So let's start with our first object objective and how PCARN and the DCC fit in the EMSC program. We've viewed this uh, graphic, several iterations of this graphic over the past few days. But as you can see, PCARN is one of many programs that make up the EMSC family, along with EISC, state partnerships, targeted issues and other organizations like the Family Advisory Network. The EMSC Data Center at the University of Utah encompasses both the Data Coordinating Center, or DCC, for PCARN, as well as NEDARC. And as we move forward with this presentation, we will focus on the DCC activities and our support of the PCARN Network. Next slide. We often talk about PCARN as a machine, as a mature network that has been around since 2001, We've well-established procedures and policies that help carry out our mission of conducting high-quality, rigorous research in emergency treatments for children. HRSA and the EMSC program fund seven research nodes or cooperative groups that together are made up of 18 hospital sites and nine EMS agencies, in addition to the Data Coordinating Center. These institutions and agencies are serving, treating, interacting with over 1.3 million acutely ill and injured children every year and more than 113,000 pediatric EMS runs annually. We want you to keep these numbers in mind as we talk more in this presentation about answering tough, large-scale research questions. We often need many sites and many patients. Next slide. So here's an outline of the PCAR network structure. The blue boxes represent each of the seven funded collaborative groups or nodes that compete to be part of PCARN. Six of the seven nodes have three hospital sites and one EMS affiliate. And the CHAMP node, as you may know, is made up of all EMS agencies. All of these nodes have representation on the PCARN steering committee. The network has, uh, also has multiple subcommittees, working groups and interest groups that work together with the DCC and HRSA to carry out the research activities. This adds up to approximately 500 people across the network, each doing their part. As we talk about forging new paths with the machine of PCARN, this really is the engine 
This is a representation of how many people it takes to do this research. Clinicians, research coordinators, EMS providers, statisticians, project managers, and other staff helping to design studies, develop grants, screen for patients, and collect data at all participating sites. The machine is a consistent group of committed people who think about how best to conduct the research. Next slide. So you may be wondering, is there a PCARN site near you? Hopefully you already know that. But the Data Coordinating Center, uh, as mentioned, is at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. Next slide. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> go forward one more. Okay, and the nine EMS agencies that make up the CHAMP node and have representation on each of the other six nodes are spread across the US. So this includes in the pink circles, representing the CHAMP node, Milwaukee County EMS, Houston Fire, Mecklenburg in North Carolina, and AMR of Western New York near Buffalo is where our CHAMP uh, nodal PI is at. And then the green stars that you can also see across this map represent um, the Columbus Division of Fire, City of Cincinnati, Aurora in Colorado, Sacramento Fire, Alameda County, both in California, and Seattle Fire Medic One in Washington State. And next slide. The rest of the colored circles represent the 18 hospital sites that round out the network. This includes emergency departments in academic medical centers and freestanding children's hospitals across 13 states. Next slide. Now let's move on to objective two and talk a little about some of the challenges in conducting high quality research in EMSC. I mentioned a few slides ago that we often need large numbers of sites and or large numbers of patients. This is because, as we know, pediatric emergency events occur at a smaller rate compared to adults. Large numbers of children are needed, so the research truly represents the population. We need to coordinate and collaborate as a consistent group of researchers to carry out the studies. And transferring the results and disseminating the information to the real-world treatment setting has its own list of obstacles. Next slide. So you can click through this as I talk. Many of you may remember this report, Emergency Care for Children. And if you look at the quotes that are pulled out here, you'll find out that this is really the reason that PCARN was in, began to, be, to begin to study uh, EMSC and why we continue. You can go ahead and click. Um, these are some statements that really address, you know, treatments widely practiced today are not um, understood and not well researched. And so PCARN is here to make sure we do that. You can go ahead and click again to make sure we research all the treatments that are out there and you can click one more time. Um, so research networks have been successful. PCARN has been very successful. It allows us to get access to large populations to answer questions in the emergency department or pediatrics as a whole, as well as for EMS. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Next slide, please. So a lot of people ask, how does PCARN decide what to study? Um, we have a lot of methods to do this, and in this slide you can see a group of people sitting in the background, and that's an actual PCARN steering committee meeting. All of these folks are sitting around thinking about and evaluating research projects. You can click through this, there's a couple animations, I think. Um, here's some of the topics that have come up and are discussed. Every meeting, we ponder each one of these topics. Can we study it? How, what of these topics lack evidence? What is unknown and how can we prioritize this research to make sure that we meet the needs of EMS, um, emergency department physicians, and others who care for kids? Next slide. So if you're a clinician, physician, nurse, or EMS provider and have a research question to bring to PCARN, please reach out to your local PCARN representative or the steering committee chair, Brooke Lerner, or myself or Sally Joe. The process for bringing a study to life is demonstrated here on this slide. Investigated, investigators present the idea to the steering committee. It gets discussed and voted on. Approved concepts are then developed into a grant or protocol with a budget. Groups within PCARN review the idea for feasibility, safety, and scientific validity. Investigators are provided lots of feedback. The steering committee will review the project again when the grant is ready for submission, just to make sure it has the best chance of getting funded. 
Obtaining external funding is key to being able to carry out these large scale projects needed to answer important clinical questions. And once funded, the projects can begin. Next slide. So once a study is approved, it must be implemented. And this is an idea of what it looks like. We mentioned that we need large numbers of kids to conduct pediatric research. And this is an example of some of the studies that have done that. Um, we need large numbers to be statistically valid. And PCARN is well known for being able to enroll many children. So if you look at the head injury study, the abdominal injury study, fever, you can see the numbers of kids in the thousands that it takes to answer some of these research questions. And with more kids comes more sites and more complexity in the research that we do. And that's partially the role of the data coordinating center. Next, next slide, please. So what about emergency research in EMS? So here are the, some of the studies that are going on in EMS right now or that apply to emergency medical services care in the field. Um, you'll notice the cervical spine injury study and the PD dose study and the suicidality suicide study. We're going to talk about these in more detail later in the talk. But again, look at the numbers, 19,000 kids to study C-spine injuries, 6,000 kids to study dosing in the field for seizures, and the suicide study, 10,000 children. So this is where the complexity and why does it take so long? Why does it cost so much? What do you guys do is partly answered by just looking at the volume of kids that are needed to answer some of these questions. Next slide. So the other question we get is, what does the data coordinating center do? You can go to the next slide. And the answer here is that you've now heard how ideas are born in PCARN, how they move forward from idea to a mature uh, concept and get implemented into a study. So the role of the data coordinating center here is that we plan and manage the study. We act like a contractor, if you will, thinking about how many patients do you need? What kind of data do you need? What are the risks of the study? How can we make this study successful across multiple sites? So the Data Coordinating Center helps the network also reuse lessons learned. So sometimes we'll conduct a study and say, oh, we got to make sure we do this in the next study. And we can reuse some of these uh, learned lessons learned, our practices to make sure that the next research project is even more efficient. And lastly, of course, the Data Coordinating Center analyzes the data, data which helps answer the research question. Next slide. Let's take a closer look at what projects the DCC is supporting in PCARN right now. We know from experience that in order to maintain a successful network, there must be a pipeline of studies and clinical trials. We need new ideas coming in that lead to active studies, active studies that enroll successfully and answer important research questions, and publications to disseminate results that lead to additional new project ideas. The graphic here shows how we start with projects in the development phase. This ranges from studies about febrile infant treatment, pneumonia, post tonsillectomy bleeding, musculoskeletal infections, to things like seizure management, antibiotic use. We have 11 grants that are under review for funding, including topics such as abdominal and head trauma, shigatoxin infection, sickle cell, uh, pain, opioid use, suicide, and treatment of respiratory distress in the EMS setting. And then there's 11 active studies looking at several respiratory conditions like cervical spine injury, head ache, pain, sepsis, sickle cell, and, and sexually transmitted infections. And then another 12 that are finishing analysis and manuscript development, disseminating information to the clinical providers. So in summary, it, all this work really represents over 44 projects happening at the same time in various phases of development. This impacts over 65,000 children who are participating and engaging in the research studies and more than 50 hospitals and EMS agencies. Next slide. Each study or trial that comes to the DCC making its way through the life cycle or pipeline as described on that previous slide is supported by a team made up of project managers, clinical data managers, statisticians, program directors, and IT support. The team is led by PhD statisticians that function as the DCC principal investigator for each project. Oftentimes when we speak about the data coordinating center, folks assume that we're just involved in the data analysis part of a project. However, the Utah DCC is a full service soup to nuts, as we like to say, operation. We specifically enjoy working with clinician investigators early in the process as the research questions are formulated and the grants are developed. 
we're always looking for new and innovative ways to efficiently and effectively carry out funded studies and accomplish the goals of each project. There are also many rules and regulations in clinical research aimed at protecting our patients and families as they volunteer to act as participants. And understanding the regulatory requirements and providing training to all the sites is also a key component of our work. Working on projects across, across the network allows us to carry forward lessons learned, as Sally Jo mentioned, from each study. So we can provide guidance and suggestions on what worked and what didn't based on that past experience. Next slide. In the end, we want to carry out safe and successful studies with clean, valid, and reproducible data, ultimately creating results that will advance the care for children in EMSC. Next slide. So now we'd like to move to show you some completed studies that show the impact of PECAN research. Next slide, please. So th these are some of the completed research studies that you may have heard before. These are, this is information you can use. So as you can see, PCARN has spanned a variety of different disease entities, looking at trauma research, looking at head trauma, abdominal trauma, C-spine, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, in medical emergencies, we've covered a lot of topics that impact emergency care in the field, as well as in the emergency department. So again, you remember back to that prioritization of research, actually implementing research and bringing that information to those who need it. Next slide. When we actually have these studies completed, the next challenge is to get the message out. So it doesn't do any good to just complete a study if nobody knows about the results. So the next step is to think about how do we get this to the folks that need this information. The main step in doing that, especially in the beginning of PCARN, was publication. Publicizing results in medical journals is a very important way, obviously, to get the information to practicing physicians. But not everybody reads every article. So we've had to update that and add some additional dissemination practices, which I think Melissa will tell you about in the next slide. That's right. As Sally Jo mentioned, getting the word out and disseminating results has its challenges. Over the past few years, the PCAR network has developed the Dissemination Working Group to help share information and get results back to clinicians in digestible, practically applicable ways. You can see podcasts on the latest publications or study findings, and we want everyone, of course, to follow at PCARN team on Twitter. We're also excited to collaborate with the EIIC as toolkits are developed, following links on the EIIC website and on the new PCARN website, which is coming out soon. Next slide. All right, so now we'd like to move into talking a little bit more about the studies that are coming down the pike. And these are ones that may be of interest to you so that you can expect, know what to expect from PCARN in the future. Next slide, please. So we've talked about understanding what does PCARN do, what does the data coordinating center do? So we're going to dive deep into a couple of studies here that I think will be particularly interested to anybody who cares for children in the scope of EMSC. So this is a study called Development of a Pediatric Cervical Spine Injury Risk Assessment Tool. And the physician who's led this initiative for many years is Dr. Julie Leonard from Nationwide. Um, and the problem here, as you well know, is that C-spine injuries are serious injuries, um, but they're rare. And so especially difficult if you're going to study a rare disease, how are you going to find enough children to enroll to answer your research question? So not only are they rare, but then spinal precautions and transport protocols that immobilize kids are very, very common. So you have rare injury, lots of immobilization. And thus, you end up with a situation where millions of kids every year with no cervical spine injury are perhaps immobilized unnecessarily. So the conclusion here was, could PCARN study a way to develop an EMS systems tool or pediatric C-spine tool that would help reduce the number of children that need to be transferred, transferred with spinal precautions and also avoid not only the immobilization, but the uh, radiation that happens when a child arrives to the emergency department. Next slide, please. So this will give you a good idea of the process that Melissa outlined earlier. So starting in 2005, Dr. Leonard presented her idea to PCARN. It was voted through the system and we initiated the study. This was a targeted issues grant that funded this initial research. 
to look at a, do a retrospective chart abstraction as the first step in this long C-spine path. So Dr. Leonard retrospectively looked at numerous charts from all the hospitals in PCARN and was able to identify eight risk factors that predict, predict cervical spine injury in children. So next step, how do you begin to think about studying this in the EMS setting? How do you think about answering this question so that perhaps EMS providers in the field can change practice? So the next step here was to establish an infrastructure to figure out how to work with EMS in a research um, manner and also ED providers and figure out the accuracy of these eight PCAR and C-spine risk factors. So Dr. Leonard, Leonard tested this at her own site at Nationwide Children's in Columbus, Ohio. So that took some time. The next step was to get a large grant funded to complete the ultimate study. And that was to develop and test a pediatric C-spine assessment tool to identify which kids needed a mobilization and which, which kids do not. Next slide, please. So where are we going with this? The update on the cervical spine injury study is that we've collected data from EMS and ED providers on these C-spine risk factors. And this is necessary because we have to look at the risk factors and then we have to test them on a population and say, is this actually as predict predictive as we think it is? There are 19,000 kids enrolled to date. We're following these kids for 21 days. And the ultimate goal is an accurate field tested tool that identifies who is at risk for C-spine injury and then can guide the appropriate application of spinal immobilization. So that's where we are with C-spine. So this is pretty exciting. We're getting close to the end of this study. And as you can see, this has been a long process. Um, this is another frustration that I know people have in EMSC. Why can't you just go out and do this study in like 12 months or six months? Why would it take years to answer a question? And so I think you see hopefully with this progression, that you can't just necessarily walk out and do a large scale study with 20,000 kids without really thinking, thinking through the pieces, thinking about how to identify the predictors that you're going to ultimately test. It's not a fast process, but for this study, we're getting to the end, which is kind of exciting. Next slide, please. So that was the C-spine study. So let's look into now a completely different area of study and talk about teen suicide. So I know from previous talks throughout this conference that you've heard about some of these scary facts about adolescence and suicide. Um, this is something that is critical. We all see it, we all know about it, but how are we supposed to make an impact on it? So here we began to ask in PCARM, what if you could develop a tool that would identify kids at risk for suicides? Um, how would you do that? How would we even begin to study that? So that was the question that PCARN uh, pondered at the very beginning of this study. Next slide, please. What are some of the, the barriers and the difficulties in studying suicide in adolescents in a pediatric research network? So first of all, it's difficult design, to design a way to find the youth that you want to study. Unlike broken bones or C-spine injuries, they're easy to find. But if you're looking for adolescents who are at risk for suicide, it's much more difficult to identify these kids to even study them. Furthermore, if you design a test or a, a, a quiz or a survey or a tool that will identify youth at risk, you want it to have high sensitivity. That means you're going to find the kids that really are at risk for suicide without finding too many false positives. So you got to find a tool that will give you the right mix of identifying the correct kids. It's also difficult to study this group because kids conceal their thoughts. So it's not easy to identify kids at risk. And also when we're studying these children, we must not just study the kids that are presenting with a mental health complaint, but also those that are not to make it generalizable to a larger population. Next slide, please. So in order to do this, we identified through thinking about this project for a number of years, we need a large type diverse group of teens to screen. We need to test survey questions that might identify which kids are at risk by using a tool called computer adaptive screening. Then once you have the teens complete these questions, you need to follow those teens to see if they attempt suicide or not. Now think about that's a little bit scary. Um, when you're following C-spine kids, you're gonna find out whether they had a cervical spine injury, but if you're studying suicide, you're gonna see if if uh, patients complete or not, which is not an easy thing to think about. 
We must also provide mental health referrals if kids indicated that they did have suicidal thoughts or suicidal risk. So that has to be built into the research process. And then finally, with the data that we collect, we must build and validate the tool to assure that it accurately and appropriately detects suicidality. Next slide, please. So where and how would anyone ever implement such a study? So fortunately, Dr. Cheryl King brought this study to Peacon in 2013. She worked with the D she and her collaborators worked with the DCC to develop the study further, and then it was submitted to NIH and finally funded in 2015, which was really exciting. We then identified the PCARN sites that had the resources to participate in the study. In part, these are sites that had to have mental health uh, capabilities to provide mental health and social work intervention in the emergency department. We then implemented a two-phase observational study with the goal of validate, validating a computer adaptive survey to identify teens at risk for suicide. Next slide. So what's the goal of adaptive screening? So if you think about a teen who might go to a school counselor or a psychologist to be evaluated for depression or suicidality, you can imagine that there would be a number of questions, maybe an interview, maybe an hour long process to assess this child to see if there might be a risk. But we're talking about emergency medical services. So now we're looking at a tool, a computer adaptive testing process to identify questions that will accurately identify kids at risk and not take a whole hour or two hours to do it. So this is a process of reducing the number of questions that we asked, put it on a tablet so kids can accurately fill out a survey. Um, and that's something they're comfortable with because we're obviously integrating more electronic tools into healthcare. Next slide. So what did we do? The study, we enrolled 6,000 teens in, at 15 sites. We followed them for three months. We started out with the survey that began with 92 questions around suicidal ideation, depression, self-injury, alcohol and drug use, all those sorts of things. Then we trimmed those questions down based on their ability to identify suicidal risk to select the questions that would be used in the final CASI tool. So the CASI tool is the nickname for the tool that we finally derived. Once we derived this tool, it's like, okay, this looks like the questions that will probably identify kids at risk. Now we've got to follow up and test that on a new population. So that was another 4,000 children that were then enrolled at PCARN sites to test this to see if it delivered. Next slide, please. So at the sites, they approached families for consent. They conducted the computer adaptive testing in between x-rays and labs and physician exams in the emergency department. And then if a teen scored high enough, they had to trigger, it triggered a social work visit and a consult to make sure that the teen got the mental health care that they needed. Finally, all the data was entered, uh, follow-ups were done with children. And you, you can just think about how many people this took. It took about 50 to 60 people involved in this work every day for a couple of years until the patients were enrolled. Next slide. What did the data coordinating center do? Well, probably what you would expect. We provided technical support for all sites. We created the data entry system, the database. We tracked suicide attempts, gestures, and suicidal completion. We cleaned and validated the data. We completed the data analysis. And unlike some of our other studies, we helped with many other people provide emotional support for the sites. Research coordinators are enrolling kids who are at risk for suicide and who may have actually committed suicide later. This is a very tricky study and one that was um, important to provide so psychological support to everybody involved. Next slide, please. All right, so the results. This study validated the CASI, which now can help predict adolescent suicidality using a one to two minute screening strategy. So from those 92 questions and a potential you know, two hour evaluation to identify a child at risk, we now have a one to two minute screening tool, which is terrific. Um, and this is important. It can be used in a variety of settings. Um, we de demonstrated using this tool, we could identify 80% of youth who attempted suicide in three months. So it had good sensitivity, which we talked about earlier. Um, the CASI can also be adjusted to use in different settings, depending on whether you're using it in a clinic, in a school, EMS or other settings, and it's better than some of the other tools that were out there. So it was a very exciting result from this very large study. Next slide, please. So the significance of these findings, 
If we all are invested in reducing the rate of suicide, we now have a tool that can potentially identify kids at risk um, that matches then we can match teens with appropriate services if they score um, with some risk on the tool. Um, it's also now common that mobile health teams are helping triage whether patients go to the emergency department or if they're diverted to mental health in the field. So what if this could be used in the field to identify a teen and whether they needed to be actually transported to the ED or whether there was somewhere else that they could receive help. And perhaps using this tool could even help avoid the shame and embarrassment of a teen who has to be transported to the emergency department because of potentially some suicidal intention. Next slide, please. And finally, how to use this and how can we integrate this in practice? If you're interested in using this tool in your, in your daily practice or in your um, any part of the country, depending on where you work, EMS, non-EMS, um, this is the email that you can reach out and you can actually get this, the copy of the CASI and you can investigate how to implement it in your practice. And finally, Dr. Jackie Grupfeland, who was one of the investigators on this study, I spoke with her about how to really convey this study appropriately to the group. Um, and I thought she summed this up really well. She said, we do this best in PCARN. We ask sensitive questions. We set up safety planning for the kids. We've accomplished this and only in a large sophisticated network like PCARN could this have been achieved. And I thought that was just a really nice way to wrap up the importance of PCARN in answering this important question. Next slide, please. Sally Jones talked about a completed study in suicide and one uh, in progress with cervical spine immobilization. And as Jackie Grubfellen's quote there said, you know, we, we have shown that PCARN can tackle these big, hard questions. So as you look at this uh, slide, I, I actually was in the buggy behind the one that's in the picture here, having a, a big gulp kind of moment thinking about um, the hills that we were about to climb. If you know this, this is Southern Utah. Um, we, wanna, we wanna talk a little bit about the hills or the, the uh, obstacles, the hills that we're climbing next in PCARN. Next slide. So the PD dose study or pediatric dose optimization procedures in EMS is a newly funded study just this past week uh, by the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, or NINDS. Dr. Manish Shah from Baylor College of Medicine is the principal investigator and aims with this study to measure the impact of standardized paramedic administered midazolam dosing, uh, sorry, midazolam dosing on seizure treatment. If the intervention is demonstrated to be safe and more effective than current practice, which is calculated based dosing, the potential impact is really a paradigm shift in EMS based pediatric seizure treatment across the country. You can imagine the complexity on our previous two examples of moving clinical research with large scale studies like this to the pre-hospital setting. So what kinds of challenges and barriers do you expect us to encounter? Throw comments in the chat, feel free to come off mute if you want. Um, you know, we really want to think about and part of the DCC's work and working with the investigative team is to think about the challenges and barriers that we're gonna encounter as we launch this kind of trial. This, uh, you can go to the next click. So this is the first large scale pre-hospital study uh, conducted in PCARN. Uh, we're thinking about things like, how can we make sure the paramedics have all the training on the study procedures that they need to carry out the activities? How do we stock medications and provide dosing information specific to the research protocol? How do we collect data? We've, we've talked about that before. Um, what if patients don't get taken to a participating ED? So we may have a participating EMS agency that takes them to a location, uh, maybe that's not a participating ED. How do we meet regulatory and FDA requirements to be able to carry out the study? And I wanna bring back the point one more time about needing many sites and many patients to answer these big questions. That holds true for this study too. Go to the next slide, please. So here's a representation of the 20 metropolitan areas participating in PD dose. I know this is a really busy slide, but it, that's the point. Um, it really shows you how roughly 24 emergency departments, over 30 EMS agencies, and approximately 23 regulatory groups or institutional review boards that govern the research are all involved to be able to make this happen. 
As you can imagine, just putting the contact list together for this study was quite a task. There's many challenges ahead, but this is such an exciting and groundbreaking study. And Dr. Shaw and the team are truly forging a new path, laying the groundwork for a whole new generation of EMSC research. Next slide, please. Okay, well, we had to go fast, so I guess we did go fast, but that's good. We just have a little bit more time for questions. Yeah. So, um, so I have, uh, sorry, Sally, I was just going to um, kind of summarize things here as we wrap up. Please feel free to put questions in the chat as we're kind of summarizing our, our main points today. Come off mute. We want people to feel free to speak up. But today we've talked about PCARN and the DCC, how we formulate questions, asking how and why and when, how we study data and what's happening in the clinical setting and how we answer these questions. We've shared how the DCC functions to support the network, acting much like the contractor of a high-tech construction project, planning, managing, and analyzing along the way. And we've given several examples of research studies that are helping to improve care for children in the ED and the pre-hospital setting. So I see a couple things popping up here. Um, what is the top thing that EMSC state partnership program managers can do to help with dissemination? So I'd say one of the most important things is, first of all, being just aware of what's going on in PCARN. Um, as you can see, there's lots of studies that are happening. And I'm aware that some of those are more um, applicable to transmit to from, from the um, program manager standpoint um, to the people that you serve and the people that you work with. So I think, first of all, there's a little sorting that needs to go, go on and picking the, and that's partly why we gave the talk the way we did today. We really wanted to pull out studies that we thought would be most applicable to EMS. Um, and I think just being first of all aware of that and starting to talk about that to those who you think would be interested in saying, hey, this, this study is coming down the pike. PCARN is looking at C-spine. PCARN has looked at suicide. PCARN is looking at dosing in EMS. I think that is one first step that's really important. The second is to be aware of when the study results are gonna be out. Um, as you can see in the chat, we have many methods for dissemination. So if you can tweet something, retweet something, um, put on an educational program, ask one of us to come and speak. Um, as you can see from the map that Melissa put out there, there's many people in your regions to come and um, deliver some of this information if you wanna use it that way. I think those are some places to start and I'd welcome anybody else in the audience to add some more ideas. No, Joe, this is Nate. Uh, I would add, um, uh, as you said, follow us on Twitter because we actually have a, a very powerful kind of dissemination wing in uh, PCARN, each of the nodes in PCARN has a expert disseminator and they work closely with the EIIC. Uh, and on our Twitter handle, they will not only disseminate results of studies, but talk about uh, older work, new work and ongoing work. So I would encourage folks to follow that Twitter handle. Um, this is Tom, I'd also put in a plug for the EIC. Um, a lot of the work they're doing, I think you heard about earlier in the uh, uh, in the conference, is geared towards EMS, and really it's meant to be practical. I mean, very simple to navigate. You click on it, and it gives you a lot of information really quickly about what you need to think about. Uh, it's something, there's a lot that's being in development, uh, a lot that's in development, um, so uh, stay tuned. There's a lot more to come. And I was going to say that as well, Tom, thank you, um, you know, really staying in tune with all of our EMSC partners and using the tools that were being created to, to share across the programs and the EIC website, the toolkits that are being created, um, the, the Twitter feed, you know, we'll post podcasts on either the EIC website or the new PCARN website. So just really understanding what resources are out there. Any other comments or questions? This is Mark Auerbach. There was a question by Erica Kane, who's one of the state partnership managers. I tried to answer it, but hopefully we can hear more from the PCON group, uh, a larger PCON group, which is what is the top thing that EMSC state partnership program managers can do to help with dissemination? So I, I think Mark, that's what kind of what we were just answering with, um, Tom's comments and Nate's comments about utilizing our EISC partners, podcasts, okay. and toolkits and things like that. So I think we've got that one okay. covered. 
Okay. Yeah. And at their state partnership advisory meetings and other things, because the managers have all of the, um, their stakeholders, but then they also have the advisory committee and other things. So um, I, I agree with all the things you said. Uh, and, and certainly as the lead on the state partnership domain, happy to help liaise with PCARN and the state partnership programs. Thank you. Other questions or comments? We have we have a few minutes, believe it or not. So uh, we'd like to hear some more questions or any comments that anybody would like to make. We're watching the chat. Maybe I'll make a quick comment if that's okay. I, thanks for this great presentation. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that I recognize being a new member of PCARN and from your presentation that I think we can't reiterate enough is that it's worth all the pain of um, doing this right and going through uh, this very long process, very long detailed process because there are so many partners and so many smart people that are um, adding their advice and their thoughts uh, to creating absolutely amazing projects and answering questions that all of us across the country can use both in the field and in our emergency departments. So um, trust the process. I guess that's what I want to say. That's great. Thanks, Eileen. And, and I was thinking about something else as Mark was just talking a minute ago. I mean, I think one of the exciting things about research these days is that it is possible to disseminate things much more rapidly. And it's just a matter of people being aware of what the source of data is, What's a good source? What's a bad source? We promise PCARN is a good source, um, but making sure that we can get the message out using all the tools that are available. If you think about, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you published a paper and that was it. And now we do have, you know, we have a Facebook site, we have Twitter, we have all of these other methods to disseminate. Um, the EIIC is helping even more with that. So um, voicing it to anybody that will listen is really what we have to rely on to continue to disseminate the PCARN results. So I do see one more um, comment. Thank you, Erica, um, in the chat. One of the possible EMS tech roles is to get involved in PEDS research. Any thoughts where they could get started? I don't know if anybody wants to take a stab at that. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, take a, a look at that. Um, I know here in New England, um, I'm in Rhode Island. Uh, I know that colleagues here in Boston uh, they're looking to do a collaborative, not looking, they're, they're already well into discussion of doing a collaborative among techs. Um, and so um, really my suggestion to you is reach out, just reach out to, um, um, I, I can't remember if Sally Joe or Melissa said, reach out to the PCARN person nearby you. Um, we're, we're really not that far away. Um, reach out to other PECs, because um, that's that's exactly what we're, we're doing. Um, and um, we talk about patient-centered care and, and that's so important. Um, the PECs are boots on the ground. I mean, they have such a unique perspective, such an important perspective about what's needed and what's challenging and what's hard. Um, we're all in major academic centers. A lot of the PECs are not. I mean, it's just critical, critical information that we need to know to guide our research. Um, and so, um, really, speak up, speak out, reach out. Um, we really need to hear what you guys have to say. And I just noticed also in the chat, uh, Dr. Adelgay says added that the PEC work, work, Workforce Development Collaborative will be doing a QI. Um, that's a great way to work on this. Also, many PECs that are participating in the TI projects are also a good example. So thank you for that. I think we're just about at the end of our time. We have time for maybe a couple more questions or comments. If there is any other, anybody else who wants to speak up. So we could go ahead and go to the last slide as we've got a final few comments showing up in the chat. Thank you for those. Can we switch over to that last slide, please? Here we go. So I love, um, Kate said, we're just beginning to learn more about the PECs and, our, and to grow um, their skill set. I think that's fantastic. Um, the, so 
really the take home message here is that we're, we're building a body of evidence-based knowledge. And, you know, we, we've kind of teased that we're forging new paths and adapting as our theme for the conference, but that's really what's happening. We're paving new paths with larger, more complex trials than ever before, improving care for kids in your neck of the woods. So we just wanted to say thank you for your time today. We really appreciate you tuning in, especially at the, the tail end of the conference. Um, we do encourage you to hang on and hop over to uh, the main meeting platform for the final presentation of the week. This is one of our PCARN colleagues, Dr. Jordy Wells, who will be um, rounding out the conference with her presentation. So thank you again, everyone. Thanks so much. Sally, Joe, and Melissa, this is Laura from HRSA. Thank you so much for the presentation. I just have a, a question and follow up. Um, um, I was wondering, I, and we've kind of chatted about this before, but I was wondering, since we have some of the PCARN folks on the call, that there might be some discussion around how you go about seeking like sources of funding for the studies themselves. So um, has there been consideration for private funding or uh, uh, other sources outside of NICHB and some of the NIH affiliates? And so just wanted to inquire into some of the thought processes in the, uh, behind that. Yeah, I'll just, um, can I just make a quick uh, comment to that? We only have a minute or two, but um, in, in PCARN, for those of you who are not familiar with the funding sources, so the infrastructure, of course, gets funding from HRSA and yeah, EMSC, which is great. And that's just, it builds the framework for us to go out and chase other money. And so our primary sources are the NIH, uh, HRSA also funds research, um, uh, EMSC, et cetera. But for example, federal partners, PCORI is a federal partner that, um, we look to um, people who apply for foundation uh, funding as well. Uh, other people are looking for crowdsourcing. I mean, we'll we'll go to go uh, anywhere uh, where there is appropriate funding. We haven't, you know, we've considered uh, private partnerships as well, uh, and we would certainly consider doing that if it was in the sweet spot of or what we wanted uh, to investigate. And we've gotten close in sort of public-private partnerships, but haven't quite gotten there. So the bottom line is we look everywhere um, uh, for funding. And I'll just add to that. Um, it really is across the spectrum too, when we're trying to do really large scale studies with multiple sites and thousands of patients, we need the big dollars. And, and so um, looking at those opportunities, but also when we're starting small with planning grants and you know initial inqu inquiries, asking the smaller questions that are building into bigger projects, I know investigators are, you know, looking within their own institutions for smaller grants and funding opportunities, even within their own institutions. All right, well, I think we are at our time. So thanks everybody for your attention and your contribution. We're happy to see you. And I see the link back to the, yep, in the comments, there's a link back to the plenary session. Thanks, everyone.